I was talking to Jennifer just before and uh, learned that Rube Goldberg is from San Francisco. I never knew that. Um, so I'm really looking forward to, to uh, learning more things and uh, watching her do some things. Yes. So without further ado, June Goldberg. Hi, everybody. <laughs> So thank you for uh, coming here. I am Rube Goldberg's granddaughter and the keeper of the flame in the family. Uh, this is actually a picture of how I remember my grandfather. He always wore a bow tie. He always had a cigar. Uh, he always had suspenders. He was neat and crisp and pressed and a gentleman, always on time. <laughs> but how does everybody else know Rube Goldberg? Well, some people might know that he was a Pulitzer Prize winning cartoonist. This was uh, a cartoon that ran right after the war ended and it won him a Pulitzer. He was also um, the first president of the National Cartoon Society and when you win an award for cartooning, uh, just like you win a Grammy in music or an Oscar in movies, you win something called the Rubin and he designed it, it was named after him. And actually the Rubin Awards are taking place next weekend in DC. Um, but I think everybody's here because they know Rube Goldberg in this context as an adjective. Um, and how did he get this, this moniker and how did he get known for his kind of sense of humor and his wacky contraptions uh, that complete a simple task um, in a kind of ridiculous way? <laughs> Um, it's from these cartoons, and these are the classic invention cartoons of Professor Butts, and you'll learn more about him in a minute, but um, this particular cartoon uh, is how to sharpen ice skates. And actually, Rube never built these contraptions. A lot of people think, you know, he must have built them, but he didn't. Um, in his lifetime, uh, they've estimated that he drew 50,000 cartoons <laughs> which is an awful lot. <laughs> um, some of you may have seen him or the cartoons, on, not the cartoons, excuse me, the uh, machines that are part of the competitions on Jimmy Kimmel. And I'll talk about the competitions in a little while, but um, we do uh, a variety of competitions from online middle school to high school to college. And I'll be t announcing our big uh, partnership with Maker, with Mad Science, um, and Sharon is right there. Uh, they are going to be doing ages six to 11, uh, competitions all around the world. So this is me with my grandfather. And a lot of people think, well, how, you know, what was it like having Rube Goldberg as a grandfather? And I really knew my grandfather kind of the way most people in this room know their grandparents. Um, and believe it or not, this was the only picture I could find of the two of us that ended up, uh, thankfully, in the book. Um, I found it about a week before we went to press. Um, but he was, he was Papa Rube. And I tell people, you know, his favorite dessert was whipped cream. He taught me how to shake hands. He taught me how to make paper balloons, not paper airplanes, but paper balloons. And um, we also would draw together. So he would draw an elephant and hand me a pencil and say, okay, now you draw an elephant. And this is, these are some of the drawings we did together. Uh, when we were at the beach, I must have been about seven um, when we did these together. And I always thought it was funny that he signed the drawings. He must have known somewhere along the line I would need them for a book. Rube was a San Francisco native. He was born here and raised here. Uh, he went to Lowell High School, and this was his re report card and the first um, of his drawings. So that was the high school paper in 1900. And it's funny, the, the students from Lowell High School actually built a great machine that uh, was in City Hall last week to commemorate and celebrate the landmarking of the Rube Goldberg building, which is on Goff Street. Goff and Sutter, I think, is, are the cross streets. And then he went on to UCAL Berkeley, where he studied engineering. 
Uh, so in 1904, he graduated. These were some of his drawings from the yearbook. And he is the third one down on the first row. Now this is Professor Slate. Professor Slate was um, one of his teachers. And Professor Slate taught Rube engineering at Berkeley. And one of the um, lessons that he, or projects he gave his students, was uh, to build a contraption that could weigh the world. Which, you know, it kind of, like, even if you could weigh the world in that way, why? <laughs> so Rube thought it was pretty crazy. It was called the Baradike. And that particular uh, lesson, um, Rube would credit later in life uh, to being the impetus for all of his invention cartoons. And to the next to Professor Slate is Professor Butts, the alter ego of my grandfather. So these are just a few of the invention cartoons. So this is a simple garage door opener. Uh, this is a self-scrubbing bath brush. Here's a safe firecracker. Here's an automatic dishwasher. It gives you an idea how long ago this was. And here is a, a great wearable on how to uh, remember to mail your wife's letter. Um, so now, some people will say, now what's the best part of being Rube Goldberg's granddaughter? Um, I, I always say that um, it's the people I get to meet and uh, it has expanded my world incredibly. And I'm very honored to say that Joseph Hersher is a friend. I think he carries on um, in the true kind of zeitgeist of my grandfather. So I'm gonna play you the page turner right now. Joseph is great, and he's actually one of the judges consistently in our online uh, middle school competition. Um, so anyway, in the, um, it's a great video, in the uh, making of the book, we were kind of trying to figure out what was the first invention cartoon. And Rube remembered it one way from interviews I'd read, and uh, we started doing some investigating. And this apparently seems to be the very first invention cartoon, a simple mosquito exterminator, which was July 12, 1912. I mean, July 17, 1912. Um, this is now. I'm going to talk a bit about uh, Rube's influences and the people who really were important in his life. And his father was a huge, huge influence. Um, his father was the sheriff of San Francisco. His badge is there. He was also a parks commissioner for a period of time. 
and they both shared a love of cigars, so they're lighting each other's cigars here. And then this is my grandmother in their wedding cartoon, and uh, it's, it's interesting. It's, one of the, it's the only cartoon that I know of where he actually inserted a photograph, and it kind of makes sense because he never seemed to be able to capture my grandmother um, whether it was in sculpture, which he did later in life, or in drawings. Um, he said he just could never capture her beauty. But she did have an influence on him, and uh, the photograph is one of my grandmother's famous tea parties during Prohibition, and they would um, get dressed up, and uh, the ladies who were around influenced my grandfather, so this is one of his other series called The Weekly Meeting of the Tuesday Ladies Club. And as you can see, he can't help himself. He has to put you know, a pretzel machine on one side of the <laughs> cartoon. The ladies are going to meet the pretzel maker. Let me see, is this, there we go. And then in compiling all of the inventions for the book, um, what I noticed was there was an extraordinary amount of what I call wearables, wearable contraptions, inventions. And really being at Maker Faire, I am seeing a ton of this, and it's really fantastic. Um, but to see the inventions that he was making, that Rube was making in the 20s and 30s and 40s, some of them have actually become a reality. Not so much the self-tipping hat or the bread basket hat, but, but um, he had, he has a wonderful contraption about how, I, I don't have it here, it's in the book, um, how you can harness yourself into a movie camera and then we won't need police anymore to decide or bystanders to decide you know, how something happened, we will be able to film it. So that has actually come to pass. So this is probably his most famous wearable. Uh, it's the self-wiping napkin. And um, the funny thing about Professor Butts, I always love this aspect. Professor Butts walks in his sleep, strolls through a cactus field in his bare feet, and screams out an idea for the self-operating napkin. So Professor Butts was always having problems and accidents and in a haphazard way figuring out how to do something like this. Um, and then each, cart each invention cartoon typically ends with uh, a little snarky other aside. So this one, after the meal, substitute a harmonica for the napkin and you'll be able to entertain the guests with a little music. So Rube and Charlie Chaplin were good friends, and the cartoon you just saw ran in 1931. Modern Times was made in 1936, and um, I have this sense that, uh, that Charlie and Rube might have consulted a bit on the machine, the feeding machine. That particular cartoon ended up being a stamp. Some of you may have it. It was a series of cartoon stamps. And the internet kind of changed everything uh, in the world of Rube Goldberg. And I'm going to talk a bit about how this sort of landed in my lap. Um, my father, Rube's son, um, had created a company called RGI in the early 80s to house the cartoons and the registrations and the trademarks. and. Uh, when, uh, during my whole life, pretty much, I was a fashion designer, and I didn't really want any part of Rube Goldberg, <laughs> and my dad kept wanting me to join him in this. My father was, uh, he was a producer. Um, he produced uh, My Dinner with Andre, if some of you guys have seen that movie, um, and he wrote for the early days of television, Bonanza and Gunsmoke and The Rifleman with my mother. But so this was an aside, it was a way of keeping his father's you know, work in the, you know, out and about in the public eye, and as a way of creating these competitions. So STEM and STEAM education, before it even had that an acronym, was really in my father's uh, kind of landscape. Um, so when my dad died, he had already, I, had a handshake deal with a company called Abrams, a publishing company, 
to do this quintessential book on Rube. And I, the first person on the receiving line <laughs> was my editor, and he said, I hope you will take over this project. And I, I, I said, call me in a couple months, which he did, and it took about seven years to do the book, and I'm, I'm, this is sort of a precursor to the internet stuff, but um, I felt to really reintroduce Rube correctly, I needed to kind of discover who he was. And UCAL Berkeley, his alma mater, has 12,000 original drawings. They were donated in Rube's lifetime. I spent a few weeks in the archive there, and I got to know my grandfather in a whole different way. And what was stunning to me, because I think when you have a very famous person, a genius in fact, as a family member, especially for a father and son relationship, it's tough. And I never could quite understand my father struggled with his relationship with his dad, his, my father's brother did as well, and I was a full generation removed, and um, it was kind of overwhelming to see the output and the breadth of the work, the scope of the work. Um, but then what happened was, in the course of the seven years that I was working on the book, um, the internet made Rube something else. He became searchable, hashtagable, viral. And I realized that I wasn't just putting a book together, I was watching a brand come together before my eyes. Um, so I'm sure some of you in this room have seen the OK Go video for This Too Shall Pass. It's a great video, great song. Um, they did a Rube, excuse me, a Rube Goldberg um, music video. And to date, it's got almost 50 million views. So that's rather remarkable. Uh, Joseph Hersher, who I showed you, has 8.3. Um, a video that I love, which if you haven't seen it, I highly recommend it, uh, is the parkour video of the French, uh, the French kind of extreme body slamming folks. So if you ever want to see a great um, bunch of Rube Goldberg videos, go to our website, rubegoldberg.com, and we have a wonderfully curated list. So, we do the competitions. We do everything from middle school to high school to college. Uh, this year's task is open an umbrella. Should be fun. Um, we have, as I said, our partnership with Mad Science for ages 6 to 11 for competitions. We have an incredible speed build trunk that we uh, have curated and are leasing to museums and libraries. We also have Rubeworks, which is an incredible game. Uh, we have the, actually the maker of this game here with us today, David Fox, he'll be at our booth. And we have a wonderful speed building booth run by Sean Jordan, our education outreach director, and Joe Kiska, and a bunch of engineering students uh, from ASU. So they are there to build with you. Um, and that's in the front of Maker Faire at the entrance. Um, so I always say <laughs> the problem solvers of tomorrow are the Rube Goldberg machine builders of today. And this particular child who I adore, Audrey Clemens, has one of the best, best videos. If you haven't seen it, do try to see it. I had tried to get in touch with him. I wanted to get a copy of the book. If any of you know him, please let him know that I'm looking for him. Um, I thought he might get a kick out of, these are some of the kind of more unusual um, things that are in the book that I discovered in the archive. These are the contraption animals, and there's a whole slew of them. Uh, the hammer-tailed whack tacks, uh, the North American kitchen vipers. Um, they're just wonderful. There are also incredible and still resonating uh, aspects of the archive that, especially in editorial cartoons, that I think hold as true today as when they were drawn. And this, I couldn't have this um, particular talk in this particular neck of the woods without showing you this cover. Um, it's from 1967, and it's after color TV, the future of home entertainment. And I don't know if you can tell, but everyone's got their own screen. And the woman in the orange chair is looking at something that's obviously happening in a different part of the world. So that's kind of 
kind of harkens to the World Wide Web. So this was, um, this photo is the last photo I have of my grandfather. He died a few weeks after this. Um, there was a giant Smithsonian exhibit in his honor, uh, and he's sitting in the, a simple device to take your own picture, which as my daughter coined it, is the first selfie. And we're hoping to actually build a, a life-size model of this. Um, and we're in talks with Ripley's, believe it or not, to have it in their flagship location next year. And that's my grandpa. And people will say, well, where do you, um, where do you think you, you'll be in 10 years with this? And I always say, well, I hope I'm waiting online for the Rube Goldberg roller coaster. And hopefully you'll be with me. <laughs> um, so there we are. Uh, I'm going to take some questions if you have any. Great. If anybody has any questions, please come to the mic in the center, the standing mic. No questions. Well, the, the fact that we're all here at Maker Faire means that you certainly are part of this world and part of the zeitgeist of what I think goes on in the building community. So don't stand in front of uh, for all of the kids who are here, I hope you have a great time. And do come and check out our booth. I think it's a, it's a great way to spend 15 minutes building your own machine that will pop a balloon. Did you also mention that you have some books for sale? Oh, yeah. I, <laughs> I have the book that we've been, let me go to the last slide. That's the book. Um, it actually has a working Rube Goldberg on the cover. And I'll be right outside if you want to come talk to me or get a book or look at the book. It's all out there. Do you have a question? It's not even a question, but since you're doing it, I didn't even know you'd be here. I just wanted to mention, uh, I found your book at the library a month ago, and my son's been asking for it every single night. It's the invention book. It's what we read to him every single night. So oh. it's a big hit. So thank you. Oh, thank you. 